everybody, we have a special guest today. Uh, he's author, political satirist. He's the subject of the documentary called Call Me Lucky, which is directed by Bobcat Goldwaite. He's uh, done a lot of things. I've heard his name. He's a legendary comedian. He's the author of Never Shake Hands with a War Criminal. And uh, he was a staff writer for Dennis Miller show. And he's toured and performed with Billy Bragg, Jackson Brown, Utah Phillips, Michelle Shockledge, Stephen Wright, Dar Williams, and numerous others. He founded two Boston comedy clubs in the 1980s, the Ding Ho and Stitches. He, and he helped to launch the careers of people like Stephen Wright, Paula Poundstone, Bobcat Goldwith, Kevin Meany, Jimmy Tingle, many others. Howard Zinn presented him with the Courage of Conscience Award from the Wellesley College. I could read this stuff all day long and tell you more about him, but let's talk to the man himself, Mr. Barry Crimmins. Hi, Barry. Thanks for having me, uh, Jimmy. Wow, it's fantastic to have you. The movie is amazing. I have a million questions. Tell people how you got into comedy. I had to turn several years of being a screw-up into research. <laughs> so that's basically how I got started. And you started your own open mic night. Now, you grew up in upstate New York. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, basically in those days, it, I just realized that the battle was stage time. So I, that's why I was in production for a while till we got a toehold. And then I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be the guy who owned the Marshall Columns, so we got to be the crappy bass player in the band. What what is the language? No restrictions. Okay, fucking great. <laughs> so you started this comedy thing. You why? No, why did you move to Boston? So you went from upstate New York to Boston. Yeah. To really start comedy, and what? Tell well, me. Well, I had been around the country before that and gone through. I mean, you know, comics were treated like crap, and so boy, uh, have things changed. Oh yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, well, well I, here's the thing. You know, I just figured. The people were treated well, and they felt like somebody when they walked on the stage. It might make a little difference, and I, not that you know, considering the enormous amount of talent that I was fortunate enough to work with, you know, you can't completely prove my point. But I, I think that you know, the fact that we acted like we were happy that you were here, if your family or girlfriend or boyfriend came in, you got. Bad and you know, so you treated people house. like like human beings, right. and uh, surprise, surprise, people gave you better performances well, when they're in a good headspace. You know, I, I think so. You know, that might have worked a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, just <laughs> it makes me remember, I was going on stage one time in Indianapolis, and uh, the big radio show there had just uh, disinvited me. Yeah, uh, for whatever reason, and right before I went on stage, the the person who ran the club came over to tell me that right before yeah. I went oh, on yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, by the way, you're not doing the radio tomorrow. They disinvited you. Go have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that would be, uh, that probably would have really cheered me up. Oh, okay. Say, like, Come on in. Huh? Gang, gang, gang. You know? <laughs> yeah, I know. Doing the morning radio is not my favorite thing, but so let's... Some of them are great, but... Yeah. Man, so now... I can't remember any good ones in Indianapolis. So now you... <laughs> <laughs> so now you... You were uh, doing what they call political comedy, Barry, mm -hmm. and uh, now that's always been an easy street. That's a fast lane to riches and fame. Comedy you know, club owners love it. Um, everybody I'm wants you. I'm a left-wing uh, political comic, started during the Reagan years, and, and nowadays I really augment that with the uh, highly lucrative uh, uh, advocacy for abused children. <laughs> so... It's just, you know, no, but you, I mean, yeah, you know, I know. Some, some people have the Midas touch. Do something with uh, meaning, and you know, where, after yeah. you make your millions. The thing is, now, I grew up, I was, my dad was a Reagan Democrat, and that's what kind of politicized me. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they... Therefore, I must continue to lie about this sensitive matter. <laughs> <laughs> so... Tear down that wall. I want to visit the rest of the SS graves. Yes, and no, it's a... It, it's, Mr. Grebachev. All you had to do was I had a class in high school and the textbook was Time Magazine. <laughs> and so I had to read Time Magazine. Now, Time Magazine's no left-wing rag no. by any stretch, even back then in the 80s. But I would read that and I would go, hey, this guy Reagan that my dad loves is screwing us. Yeah, He's yeah. screwing my dad. Yeah, yeah. Why does everybody love that guy? Why did everybody love that guy, Barry? Well, Mark Twain said we worship our oppressors. So <laughs> I guess that's basically, you know. and Stockholm Syndrome? Uh, that could be it. And and also just, you know, just just marketing. You know, tell everybody it's, <laughs> yes. uh, what, where they, it's, it's about time someone talked about how wonderful, you know. And that, yeah. Well, you know, the facts didn't line up with it, but who, who would know those? Now, uh... 
what just tell people what it was like to be a comedian, your kind of comedian during the Reagan years. Because that's a guy every, everyone loved. Like, at least during George Bush, W, well, people you know, that's, hated that's him. That's a little, you know what? Everybody didn't love him. I mean, I got away. It's just a matter of the, the point is if you go out and you sort of, and you're humorous and, and you make the point, and you, you, you sort of contradict the conventional wisdom, you can do pretty well with a lot of audiences and you can do well with a lot more people than you would expect. They just hadn't heard it that much. You yes. Know? But it, was, it wasn't like blindly support. I mean, a lot of people you could kind of bring it around to. He's a doddering old fool and, you know. Yeah. You know, just say no to drugs unless they're from the Contras. You know, I mean, it was ridiculous. Yes, okay. And people thought, and, and I mean, I did, I did okay. That, yeah, no, now Jay Leno says that first you start out as a comedian, then you become a satirist, then you become a humorist, and then you're out of show business. Now, do you agree with that? Uh, well, it's a funny joke. You yeah, know, but it's just a joke. I don't right? know. There's a movie about me opening nationally uh, Friday, so I right. think I'm still in the business. I think you're still in show business. Yeah. yeah, I always disagree with that because my favorite comics were always guys saying stuff, you know, uh, George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, Bill Hicks. I quoted you before I ever saw you or uh, met you or heard uh -huh. you. I read stuff that you had said. You know, the joke I quote. I had quoted of you often was people say, if you hate America, if you don't like America, why don't you move? And you say, because I don't want to be victimized by its foreign policy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Very good. I mean, well, there, there it is. You scratch that itch for everybody. I mean, I could get a laugh at the goddamn American Legion with that joke. Yes. Because you know? it's just like, oh, I mean, there's so much stuff where people just don't think there's an answer. And that's what I learned from people like Twain and other great humorists is you just, so generally, something that everybody believes in is horseshit. <laughs> you know, just, that's, that's it. Yes, when the majority of people start to agree on something, right. that's when it's time to go Run. the other way, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I, I, let me just talk about comedy, for instance. Like um, a lot of young comedians, I'm, I'm always perplexed by them. They, they'll ask me the same question over and over, and that question is, how do you open? And my advice to them, well, when doing a comedy show, I always open with a joke. Man, are you right? Or are you right down my alley? I hate it when I t see a young con or like you know a lot of people. It's been going on for like a few generations now, where you me meander out on the stage and you go, you know, good evening or you know, hey, how are you? Like you ask a rhetorical question, what are two hundred and thirty people going to all answer you? Yes. And you had this platinum moment where you could walk out and be funny, you know. They're waiting. You, yeah, and if you deliver then then you have them so much more on your side but if you come meander oh, how are you you know i mean if you're really famous and you have to kind of allow the the applause to die down fine but even if you're that person when the applause dies down the next thing you say should be pithy and bang and now we're off to the races and now they know they came to see the right person and it's called taking the stage that is fantastic. Yeah. I, yes, I would. I. Hmm. It's called taking the stage. That's yeah. a great advice. Yeah. People should watch this. We'll cut this up. We'll put this out. This is going to get a million credit views. hours. There'll be credit hours available. There will be credit hours available. That's all, great. All you kiddies in show business. Because you always were funny. You always had something to say. And you know, I'm always drawn to comedians like that. And I like the fact that you. And you too, Jimmy. You yeah. make it funny, and that's the thing. People, you know, I teased you. We. I made a little joke at the top of the interview about. How comedy club owners are, and uh, the business side of of comedy is afraid of people who are actually saying things with their comedy. Well, you, but you know, here's the thing: people would always say to me, "Oh, I bet your act doesn't work in the South." Hey, I worked Texas yeah. four weeks a year. I yeah. worked Alabama. Yeah. I've I've worked Atlanta, Florida. I've worked everywhere in the South. Funny is funny, and I think that's why you have such staying power in comedy is because you're funny. Well, thank you. I mean, I play all those. I mean, I've played all over the country, and they, you're treated like the Berlin Airlift. It's like, all right, somebody yes. said something about this crap. You know, there's great people everywhere. I would rather play to a crowd that's excited to see me in Arkansas than a bunch of jaded people in Manhattan. I'm, you know, they, I, I, one time Whitney Brown and I uh, played Johnson City, Tennessee in 2004. We show up. These people have literally made 
gingham tickets for the show. I mean, they made them out of cloth, you know, because that's what they had to make tickets. Uh, we arrive and like the comedians, is here. they're so happy to see us. We went out and did a show that was as great a show as I've ever done in my life. And coming in, I'm going like Johnson City, Tennessee. I'm not quite sure about that. Now, granted, I played Johnson City again, and after the show, a cop came in and he said, "I heard there were some remarks being made here," and, <laughs> and, and I and I'm going like, "Yeah, fuck yes, there were remarks made there." They're like, "You got to get on a plane tomorrow. You never get." <laughs> But, you know, some remarks were made here. But that show that we did in Johnson City was one of the greatest uh, greatest nights ever. Whitney and I still talk about it. Who lives in Austin, though? Oh, really? I didn't He's know that. He's married to the great uh, blues musician uh, Carolyn Wonderland. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Well, listen, um, what do you think... Uh, what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about America? I mean, Americans. <sighs> I, I, you know, do you mean Americans or do you mean the rest of the world? I think the rest of the world is probably relatively accurate. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm pretty well, sure they. Americans. Uh, well, here, you know what? I really wanted to. Here, the greatest land in the, you know. My, my biggest. The flag I spilled mm -hmm. fictional blood for in Culver City. Ha <laughs> ha. That's so funny. Because uh, <laughs> that's where they make all the moves. Anyway, yeah. the. So let me ask you this now. Um, uh, I've been getting a lot of, like, I'm. You grew up Catholic. I grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, you know, I tweet the Pope every day to demand excommunication. Yes, I see that. It's yeah. it's hilarious. I and love seeing that tweet. it's also meant to be like, you know, go ahead. They won't. No. They won't because they yeah. want your numbers, right? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know what they want, but they're getting it. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, the new Pope, is just like, it's, it's his job to change the subject and not the church. He would do something if he was the great you know for you know his pr guy that put it that sold him to us is uh greg burke who was the vatican correspondent for fox news no kidding and that's who's selling us the new progressive pope so yeah, no congratulations kidding. suckers you know and, and, and so, i mean he he sent uh emissaries to to speak with the gn uh, the, the un and and, and geneva uh, where they where they maintain that uh, you know child rape isn't torture, so because uh, the kind you know they, they to people were smart and said well, well let's get them on the torture statutes and he sends these people there you know I'm glad he's opposed to global warming, but you know I, I, there's a lot he could do he could open up the books uh, you know all that stuff I mean you know the Vatican's its own country yes you know you know that because Mussolini granted them nationhood so that's thanks again and uh and and so all the evidence uh in these abuse cases can be stuck in uh diplomatic pouches and no one can touch it and they fly it out there and forever it went to uh what's his name the you know the german uh, ratzinger uh and then they needed a new pope and i just kind of imagine that what went on at that point was they said uh Ratzinger said, "Well, I've been able to keep a lid on this thing thus far, but I, you know, someone I don't know who the next, what the next pope. Maybe we can make you. Pope. There's an idea, <laughs> and that's how he. I think he. That's my theory on how he ended up being pope. But he, why do you uh, think Rats? Why do you think he retired? That's the first time yeah, in a long that, time, right? Yeah, like a thousand, six hundred years or something." Yeah, I you know hopes I, don't retire except this guy did. Well, some people don't think he had. I mean, yeah, I'm not. I can't be a big conspiracy theory guy because I represent, you know, uh, abused children. So right. people don't want to believe in that. So I, I try to go with stuff that's very solid. But I, I mean, he 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 was a bad person to walk point. The heat was being turned up more and more, and they got this other guy, and he's, you know, he makes these, you know, these public gestures that are nice enough. But they still haven't done a goddamn thing about, you know, I mean, like they had this. Uh, uh, he drives a Ford Focus? Yeah, right, right. Uh, <laughs> if someone wants to invite him to a disco right. party slam, who's he to condemn well, yeah, them? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so he goes, well, I mean, like, for instance, they had this guy in the Dominican Republic, this Bishop uh, Wisolewski or something. I'm probably getting it wrong. I think it's W E S O L E. W S K I A, he um, 
the guy was a you know a, 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 just a predator for t- children, and uh, they, he was really wanted in. Uh, they, they, he was going to get arrested in the Dominican Republic. They whisked him out of there, and they brought him back. And they was wandering around Rome, and somebody, and somebody spotted him like out on the street. And anyway, then they found in, in, in his Vatican residence that he had like you know terabytes of child pornography. And the church then announces, we're going to prosecute this guy. And all these people are going, like, well, now they're really cracking down. Well, that was over a year ago, or about a year ago, and his trial was supposed to start in January. And you Google the guy's name, and there's nothing going on. And I'm pretty sure this guy's, you know, saying, yeah, go ahead, you know, prosecute me. I'll do some talking at the trial. So uh, how about rendering unto, unto Caesar? You know, that, 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 that these people have broken civil statutes, and they should be held uh, accountable in civil uh, uh, courts of law. So you, uh, so you're not, not really, pro. I'm you're not, not pro Catholic Church. Nah, no, <laughs> <laughs> Me no, neither. I'm not. Yeah, no. no I've tried based to make, on fear and real estate. I originally thought. Now I know it's worse than that. I, I try to tell people that this Pope, he's really st- sticking up for the poor, and he's going to do everything he can to help the poor. Except Good. sell some fucking chalices. <laughs> except sell yeah. some stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, and then you know, of course, and he's all for the gays, except he's not going to change any of the rules. Well, right, right. And, and and you know, there's these gestures and whatever that can be made, but they're flare guns. I yes, mean, I like that. What you said, change the subject, not their policy. Yeah, not the church. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I I know. That I'm that's what I'm watching happen. You know, if this guy is sincere and such a holy person, he would care about justice. Uh, for these, I mean, you, know, you wouldn't you wouldn't be letting people like Dolan, uh, who's the cardinal in New York, who was formerly the bishop in in, in, in Milwaukee, who hid all these you know, yes. funds in a burial. I mean, if if the CEO of Sony got caught doing that, they would take him away in handcuffs. He probably wouldn't spend much time in jail, but he would at least be taken away in in cuffs. Right. This guy, you know, he's the he's the he's the you know they, cardinal I mean, of New York yeah. now, and he was when, involved uh, in a me what's it. A demonstrable, serious financial malfeasance. You know, the thing is, we got to see Dominic Strauss Kahn handcuffed and do a perp walk, but we never get to see a bishop. No. Never. Ever. ever. Yeah. So <laughs> Although, let... uh, you know, there's hope. I, You know, that's one of the only times you can get me to pray. Please, <laughs> please arrest the bishop. <laughs> please. Yeah. I'm, with you. I'm with you on that. I, I, like, I don't know about you know the what's... concept of heaven and hell. I'll know I'm in hell if there's popes and bishops there. Yeah. Now, when I started comedy, which was 1989, it was my first open mic, mm-hmm. there were guys doing pedophile, police, uh, priest molestation jokes that right. night. Right. Why did it take 20 years for the news media to catch on to this story? Well, I don't know. I mean, those are, and those guys could have been 60. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, why? Because the church is very powerful. It has a lot of influence. I mean, you, you don't hear a bunch of stuff about the Boy Scouts either. They're connected people. They know a lot of judges. They know a lot of, you know, and, and, uh, and they can call in a lot of favors. Okay. You know? All right. So Bishops now. Bishops are very good golfers from what I hear. Yes, they are. So now let's move on to uh, th- the news media in general. Okay. We make we, that's what we do a bunch of here at the Jimmy Dore Show is we criticize the news media uh-huh. for being corporate and horrible and not re, and pretending that someone standing up for workers is just the equivalent of someone who's a race baiting misogynist maniac who wants to corrupt the it's system. What, so what do you say about the news fake, media? It's fake balance, you know. It's like I don't I don't care. Like you know, but some say that the molestation of children is good for them. I mean, it's like it's fake. <laughs> Balance, you know. I don't care about balance. I care about being on the level. If you're on the level, you get the story and you tell the story. And guess what? It's not going to be this. Well, it maybe it's fifty-fifty. That this obvious wrong is an obvious wrong. It's a hundred percent. That's fucking wrong. Tell us about it. But the, you know, these guys in the media these days, they're they're corporate employees. And it's not like there's a playbook. It's not like anyone says, don't talk about this and don't talk about that. You just know what not to talk about because you're a corporate employee. You want to keep your job. You don't, sh- you don't talk about certain stuff. You don't. I mean, why do you think, you know, Grumman takes out ads on CNN because they think we're, they're going to sell us a jet? No, they're funneling money to them to not do any, you know, investigations of the Pentagon. And an outfit so greedy it has an extra side on its building. So, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's an obvious payoff, but n- no one no one discusses it. Right. But, but but here's the thing about the media. Everyone who's upset about the media 
and these corporate people not talking about stuff. I, I take it a little further than that. What's their job? I know people that have, you know, they're complaining about the media and they're not saying this and not saying that. It's like, okay, what's your job? Well, I work at an insurance company. Well, 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 what aren't you telling me? And if you told that to the media, maybe they would do that story, okay? So we all have to blow whistles. And it's sad that the, the, the people who should really be the whistleblowers, the media, it's just another part of our society that's been bought and paid for and absorbed. I mean, now you lose a gig in the media in one place, you just got fired at 314 places. So, I mean, these people know it. They worry because about their Because of the pensions. Concent yeah. concentration of the media's yeah. ownership. Right, right. right. So, right. like in 1980, I tell people there used to be 50 giant media companies that ran all the media in America. Right. Today, there's five or six, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. that run all the media. So, yeah, when you I mean, say when you get fired from one company, you're getting fired from 300 companies. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the documentary is fantastic. I mean, it's really well done. It's gripping. You know, everything you want a documentary to be. Plus, you're very funny in it. And uh, right. you get to see many different sides of you in it. And, you know, people talked about, uh, you know, when I first started, people I would say you're angry to me. And now yeah. people said the same thing. To, you know, yeah. I decided to slap on a happy face for 10 years after that right. and try to be Mr. Nice Guy, which was good in a sense because it helped me learn the craft of comedy. And you had, what, your first heart attack? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, then it was really, it was the, it, I think it was the Iraq war that changed things for me. And I was like, I can't. A lot of people. <laughs> it's like, I can't go on stage and talk about, you know, the pebble in my shoe when right. there's people walking around without feet. Well, yeah, so I had yeah. to talk about that stuff. So now. The, oh, well, I, I took a pledge. To myself a long time ago, and it was very simple. In the 80s, early 80s, I just said, I will not particip participate in the distraction of the American people. It's funny. Some people would never protest anything except the fact that you're talking about something that matters. And then I was like, we came here to have fun. Yes! But here, yeah. So here's the thing. The other thing is like, how come all political comics are left wing? Well, no. Everyone who's labeled a political comic is skews to the left in this, you know, continuum in the United States, which, you know, mm -hmm. is so far to the, to the right, right that they, I think they're holding the New Hampshire primary in the Atlantic Ocean this year. <laughs> but, um, but people don't, you know, they say, well, you make all these political statements. Well, when is somebody going out doing misogynist, homophobic stuff, you know, uh, racist stuff, whatever, you know, when you when you call them on, hey, it's all part of the, what are you, PC or something like, like, and then they turn into these martyrs on this bullshit PC, like, first off, reinforcing, reinforcing, you know, oppressive uh, status quo doesn't make you some cutting-edge rebel shithead. It makes you somebody who's, like, dressing yourself up as one because I'm – but I'm going to keep – I happen to be what you call politically incorrect. Oh, what a oh. clever fucking turn of a phrase that is. That's yes. just a – you know, excuse me. I have to go eat a bunch of macaroni and cheese because that's really – if you leave it in your stomach for a while, then you puke on the guy. It really has a bad smell to it, and I would love – you know, and you deserve that right now. You know, I mean, I'm just tired of being – I'm not I'm not more political than a lot of acts. I just get labeled as Yes, such. no no doubt about it, right? Yeah. I mean Chris Rock uh it, it also talks about George Carlin, a lot of people but they don't get the label of political comics <clears throat> and you know in the, as far as the business end goes, comedy clubs Well, get I mean, I like both those guys anyway. I love those yeah, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, I love those guys, but they somehow didn't really get that label. Um, that's all I'm talking right, about. Right. Is that no, and, and the thing is, you can you can do well with the general audience with this stuff. They live in the same planet no as kidding. us. You know, I mean, that's the, but that's the point. They know better. You know, they learn a lesson every once in a while. You know, they learn from Twain, and then they learn. You know, well, Rogers got a little way with a little something, and Lenny came along, and Morton, and. And then the Smothers Brothers, but there's these kind of jumps in between where they go, well, you know, look at the trouble they got into. We're not going to. And, and so by the time we and, and you know what, we're in this business and in this town, it certainly hit hard that was ravaged by McCarthyism. And, yes. I, and I'm tired of being and I've been fucking red baited my entire 
career, red baited all the time. And now you know the new version of it is there's drug McCarthyism now. Like, oh, that guy's on I, I hate when people say that stuff all the time. You can really discredit somebody by just saying, oh, they're on drug. You know, it doesn't have to be found. It doesn't have to be, you're on drug. Well, you know, it's drug McCarthyism. Like, first off, well, what kind of drugs is he on? And can I talk to him? You know, <laughs> I'm in a lot of pain here. I've been trying to, you know, explain things to the American people for 43 years and have kind of a bad headache. You know, the idea, people, uh, even my therapist tells me, he goes, you know, you perform a great service, Jimmy. People get to forget about their troubles when they come see you. I'm like, that's not really what I'm in it for. Uh, that's not, I mean, I right. do do jokes about my dog well, and stuff, but yeah. uh, I don't, you know, someone I once saw Bill Hicks being interviewed and they said, why do you, wh- why do you think... She goes, uh, people don't want to go to comedy clubs to think. And he says, well, tell me where you go to think. I'll meet you there. Great. That's great. I mean, this – and this crap, you know, like there's just such a lot. You know, well, if all it takes to make a few people laugh is for me to stand in an elevated place with my visage illuminated and my voice amplified so that people can make themselves feel better by – laughing and applauding for me who am i to stand in the way of their joy you know like oh you're so oh, generous oh, you're really you're a really man giver of the people you you're are, a real you know? giver i mean you just never get tired i don't know where you dig in and continue to find such generosity so where where do you uh, did you ever discover where your anger comes from do, do you do you hate that i just said that that i called said you were angry um because I used well, to hate I that mean, when people I would mean, say that I'm, about me. You know, I'm righteously indignant. I think I'm less anger. I, I'm less angry in my old age, because I have you know sourced out stuff. I dealt with the fact that I survived you know uh, several rapes as a small child, and um, and so you know, I mean, I probably might have been a little more before I worked at, on that stuff. I probably had a, a little more of a temper than I do now. But I mean. If you're not mad a lot of time, you're stupid, you know? I mean, I, I, I there are times when I just feel like happiness is a sign of adult brainness, so, uh, you know. Yes. Adult brainness? Like, like, a, will, like, like a William Hurt happen. from Broadcast News, like that yeah. kind of going through life. Like, hey, don't you realize there's things we should be doing? Right. And we're not doing them. Um, you know what? Uh, so I, I was so talk about that. You you were sexually abused as a child. That's influencing the work you do now. You want to talk about that? Or are you tired well, of talking I mean, about it? No, I mean it's simple. I just I, I think uh, children's rights and safety is the world's most overdue human rights initiative. I think that if, if you can't kids grow, you can't hate anybody till you hate yourself. Okay, so this becomes all political. You can't you know, and and you walk around uh, and no one tells you what happened to you is wrong and you're in this pain and so you at first you start thinking there's something wrong and then you start thinking well no one's doing anything there's something wrong with me there's something the matter with me and then you start to hate yourself and then you can start behaving in a way that corroborates your self-loathing and you know and we lose a lot of people to that people but i think there's sanity at the source if we have the courage to listen to people's stories if we don't poo-poo everything, you know, and, and listen. You know, when I, when I was recovering and dealing with my rapes as a child, when I was re- finally as an adult dealing with it, I would tell friends about it. I would start talking to them, and they would say to me, are you talking to anyone? Yeah, I fucking thought I was talking to you. you know? <laughs> uh, but apparently I'm supposed to go pay some guy $200 an hour to put me on pharmaceutical dry ice so I'll shut up and no one has to think about this. But, you know... Uh, I think about it, and I've done a lot of work on it. I've done stuff. I did one of the initial. Well, I was on America Online, like everybody in 1995, and I discovered all these chat rooms where they were exchanging child pornography, and I brought it to Air, Air, America Online's attention, and they ignored me, and they ignored me, and they ignored me, and then this is. I ended up testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee in Washington. And AOL stopped ignoring me after that. But it was like the only time I mean, like, wow, the government actually worked for I couldn't believe, you know, and it wasn't like there even had to be laws. They just there were laws. They needed to be enforced. And and I embarrassed them. And I and I also had a little media savvy. So I knew how to, you know, put phrases out there that would embarrass them. My favorite moment was hearing, uh, I think, a 
an, uh, an anchor on headline news say, and one witness called America Online a pedophile superstar. <laughs> you know, they changed their, uh, you know, they, they stopped uh, making it as easy to exchange photographic evidence of uh, rapes and sexual assaults and sexual exploitation of children after that. And, uh, you know, and people who talk about that in, as if it is some sort of First Amendment thing, Andrew Vox, the writer and attorney, says uh, you can mug someone and call it performance art, but it doesn't mean you're going to get away with it. People haven't seen child pornography. It isn't, you know, like, and we 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 even sanitize that. We sanitize. We got kitty porn. It sounds like the Bunny Hill or something. It sounds like it could be okay. No, it's photograph. It's graphic evidence of children being raped. And if you've seen what I saw when I did that investigation, you wouldn't have any glib attitude. And the other thing is. As a child abuse survivor, the most offensive thing anyone is a rape survivor, the most offensive thing has ever said to me is like, it's one of those people gets busted and you're like, well, Bubba will take care of him. And ah. it's like you're talking to a rape survivor and you think I'm going to sit here and snicker about rape to you. First off, if we have to have jails, how about making them lawful places? How about making them somewhere where people at least learn this other lesson that the law, OK, is something you have to follow, but it also protects you. How about that? Even in jail, there are laws that should protect you because no one anywhere should be raped and anyone who winks and nods and snickers about that stuff you know really annoys me and and then people ah, i and then I, people just want to sweep it under the rug so they make these broad well you know i just think they should all be killed and i, I don't think any of them should be killed and they say and you know and 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 they'll say look i tried to agree with you here it's like well i'm sorry that is not a you know, i mean i'm opposed to the death but i'm not i'm not barbaric i was born without blood on my hands and i'm not going to i'm not going to die with it on my hands and you know what i'm not going to become what i resist i don't have a right to call for savagery towards other human beings what i celebrate the reason the movie's called call me lucky is because i am fortunate that i became a human rights activist and not some monster okay so don't come up to me snickering about prison rape and telling me you think i should want to kill people because that's not who, who i became and i'm very fortunate for that and i'm very lucky for that, and I have a million great friends, including my friend Bobcat Goldthwait, who made a pretty beautiful movie out of my story. And, uh, and but it's not just my story; it's everybody's story. We just have to have the courage to listen to it. That's a you know, that's a great message, Barry. That uh, don't let a crime perpetrated against you turn you into the criminal that uh, violated you. Yeah, I just saw a movie with Spencer Tracy. What's it called, Steph? Fury. Fury. <laughs> Funny how I know that. Yeah, so that movie, I was like, that is probably the most powerful movie I've ever yeah, seen. It, yeah. it, and it showed how he was uh, it, accused of a crime, and then they thought they killed him. A mob got together and, and killed him. And, and it, the, the jail burned down. The jail burned he down. he was dead in the jail, and he went and hid. Right. And they were about, well, do we want to ruin the But the whole movie right? was him getting revenge on yeah. the people who had tried to kill Almost. him. Almost. Almost getting revenge on the people and how it changed him and how that is such, you know, whenever you hear. He was this lovely guy. He was a lovely guy. And because he was bent on revenge, yeah. it turned him into this horrible guy who didn't have any love to give to the rest of the world. In fact, he even lost his relationship with the one woman he was really in love with. And he had such great relationship yeah. with his brothers. It ended that anyway. It changed him. And what you're saying is that the triumph is that you didn't let that change don't you. Don't become a toxic waste dump and, and don't care. That's that guy. That did that stuff to me that hey, I'm not walking around in his pain I'm not doing it you right know, I'm not doing it I, I mean I know who it was I know he died in prison years later for the same kind of offenses he didn't mm -hmm. get arrested for what he did to me but he died in prison alone no one claimed his body and I tried to get the state of New York to tell me where his grave was so I could go put flowers on it not because I'm a big fan of the guy but because look at what I didn't become I'm not a, I'm not that, you know, and in a celebration of, of the fact that this guy couldn't extinguish the light in me the way someone undoubtedly extinguished it in, in him. Wow. That's uh, quite an evolved way to look at it. I don't think I could ever be that quite evolved. You know, they talk I'm about. I'm glad the, you haven't had to figure that out, but I, yes. I would I would bet on you, Jimmy. I'd that's bet nice on of you brother. to say. Yeah. I was almost, I had a priest come at me one time and mm -hmm. I got away, but um 
Yeah. That's we've talked about that on the show too. That's amazing that you, that you were able to do that. I mean, that's the lesson you're, we should all learn. You know, we should give. Uh, you know, when someone has their kid gets killed or whatever, and you see them, they carry that anger around for the rest of some their life. Some do, and some are. and some don't, yeah. right? So, it, just like in this the shooting recently with the racist at the church, and those people forgave the yeah, guy. Uh, oh yeah. my God, yeah. it's so powerful. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you're already in enough pain. Yeah. You walk around and take that extra dose of toxicity and just carry it with you as if it's your, you know, it's your right now. Well, it's not my right. I, I don't want it to be my right to be a toxic waste dump. I do not want to be, you know, poison. I don't want to always be thinking in terms of how to, you know, I, it, it's just like, you know, it's too many bad movies and bad writers. They don't know how to figure out how to end anything without yeah, violence. Without, yeah, without without yeah, revenge. Yeah. yeah, you are correct. Right. The, and torture and that's not a always triumph. works in movies. Always. <laughs> torture always. Always works. It never works in real life. No, it it always works. In movies. It yeah. always works. Works in Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like it's like breaking a uh, wine bottle over your head. It works in the yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah. In real life, the bottle Kong. doesn't really break. No, I could call. Yeah, no, I've, been hit, I've been oh, hit with a few. Me Kong. too. Yes. Yes. You look like the kind of guy who's been hit. You know, we are a couple of guys who've been hit with more than our share of wine. Bottles. Yes, yes, and police mm-hmm. fists. I've been hit with plenty of them. So, mm-hmm. well, that's, you know, uh, that's great that you've been able to overcome that, and now you have a positive message, and you work. Do you work with a foundation? Well, I lately, I mean, the, who I recommend anyone helping is SNAP, which is the uh, organization that deals with uh, people who survive uh, ab- uh, abuse by the clergy, um, and I just like the work they do. I was emotionally abused by a priest uh, mm-hmm. because I had already been raped. I mean, I must have, it was just so, so deep-seated in me. When the guy started to put his hands on me, I hit him with an elbow. And mm-hmm. then I always wondered why I wasn't in trouble for hitting this priest. And I had, But I had to serve Mass with him like every day, and he tried to drive me off. And so he would go up on the altar every day and denigrate me. You know, I had to serve morning, you know, early morning Mass, day right. after day, month after month with this monster. Nobody else would send their kid up to serve mass i always ended up serving mass every day this guy thomas nary uh uh you know and i mean i if i let me my we have a group of people who you know sort of a a little loose organization uh who had dealt with we call it the hell alumni association and he was this savage uh pedophile i know of, i know i knew three people who were abused who i am who who committed suicide really yes and 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 i know several of his other victims and that's just you know from a very limited area and they had him all over the place okay and so uh that guy man uh he was he was bad news but he i think he helped make a political satirist out of me because i mean you can imagine gee, why do you have such trouble with authority i don't know maybe it was the priest standing on the altar every day telling everybody i'm going to go to hell because he knew he couldn't get away with raping me you know me that might have skewed things for me a tad i grew up with a, a real deep hatred for the church and priests and my uncle was a priest mm-hmm. and the whole and i just hated authority yeah. and the day for me barry was uh, my confirmation, right? So the yes. the bishop comes to your. To, it's a right, big deal. Right, it's right, like right. Elvis is coming. Right, right. And so the bishop's coming. And, Something like frillier stuff, yeah. Yeah, and and my dad was the guy reading. He was the reader at the lector. They mm-hmm. call him anyway. He was. Uh, he brought me backstage to meet the bis the bishop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it turned out it wasn't the bishop from TV. It was one of his helpers. So right away, <laughs> and, <laughs> I was like. And he, As Kevin Rooney once said, it wasn't. He worked with Phil Silver. They said Phil was getting old. He wasn't Phil Silver. Was it was a Phil Silver's kit, you know. Like <laughs> Phil Silver, some assembly required. Yes, so this is some bishop, some assembly required. Yeah. And my and I was already deflated. Like it's not the bishop from TV. It's some guy. He's not really the bishop. And then my dad knelt down in front of him and kissed his ring. And right then was the end for me. Oh yeah. yeah. That was it. I was like, I first of all, I, I didn't realize what happened at that moment, but yeah. I lost respect for my dad. Uh-huh. Not all of it, some. Yeah. 
And because I knew that this guy was just a jerk off, right? I knew yeah. this guy is just a guy. He's a Pharisee in my head. Like right, they used right, to teach right, us right, in school. Right, 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 right. These are the guys against Jesus. He comes walking in looking just like a Pharisee. Yeah. My dad <laughs> kneels down. He kisses his ring. I'm yeah. like, this is all wrong. Yeah. And I'm 13 and I know this is all yeah. wrong. And I'm supposed to go back out there and get my right. sacrament from this right. same guy who my dad just kneeled in front of him. It was so gross. It yeah. really wrecked religion for me right then. Thank God almost. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean. You know, so well, my dad only, maybe did me a favor. I, again, the only thing I do religiously is is tweet the Pope every day demanding <laughs> excommunication. So. Well, it's nice to know that you don't let the new Pope bullshit you like he's bullshitting no. a lot of people. Well, yeah. He's not bullshitting me. As soon as he starts selling some of that gold to help people, then I'll think about it, right? right? Yeah. But driving around in a Ford Focus is not a sacrifice. It's air-conditioned, and it's got heat in the winter. It's yeah. nice. Yep. Okay, you know what? Our camera ran out of film or battery or something, but big thanks to our friend Barry Crimmins for stopping by. Go check out the movie, Call Me Lucky, and thanks for Barry Crimmins for sticking around and doing our interview for us, and uh, we'll see you next time on TYT Interviews.